Welcome. I hope that everyone is eager and excited to join us for this fantastic occasion. We have been eager here at PRE to bring this to you. So welcome, welcome one and all to the PRE launch of Bookmarked. This is our first print edition. It's an anthology, a collection of some of our great writing, some of the great writing that many of you have submitted, because I'm sure many of our writers are tuning in. So thank you for joining us for today's event, a webinar on how to work with rejection and really ideally avoid rejection as a writer. We are bringing this to you as a part of our launch because we understand that we couldn't exist without you, the writer, the poet, the wordsmith. So thank you for joining us today. My name is Isis Samaj Hall. I am a lecturer at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. And I'm also one of the founding editors of this fine magazine, this fine digital magazine. So it's actually perfect that we are here online and gathered in this way, because this is how we've been bringing you our words for so long. So I could go on and on, but I don't think that would be beneficial at this time. So why don't we all perhaps settle in to this experience, to this bookmarked occasion with some words from one of our favorite friends, the poet, Dingo. He is a Jamaican. He is a fantastic poet. He's published with Pre in the past, and we hope he publishes with us again. Um, he will be reading from his recent publication titled A Window to Let the Light Out. So Dingo, will you take it away, please? All right. Uh, I'm doing two pieces. Uh, the first one is inspired by a line from Marley. I have four pieces in the book inspired by Marley. Uh, I call them, they're gong one, two, three, and four. And uh, this particular piece is inspired by a line from Redemption Song where he says, uh, all I ever have. Um, and it feels like one of those lines which is stuck between tenses. Like, I'm not sure if he meant all I've ever had or all I'll ever have. Um, and so it inspired this piece, which is called Crawling Nine Miles in the Trench. When nothing abounds, you will color it. The world will call it whatever bends them in the direction of suit or understanding. See it as it is and badged rebel as it should be and hailed prophet. This is the curse. Become song to revolution, own with life with the heart initials. This is choice. Night will come for you, though surely there is no worse death than to outlive compassion. Surviving a hail of ballots, eyes closed, a lion flashes locks to release Babylon. Love, struggle, held patience, the pure rebellion of oneness, Kaya, Rasta, the lost in transnation, flood the slender funnel of a microphone. Before revolutions seep into pavement, they must flourish in thinking. We're coming in. Soon then we hear what bedrock whisper to the passing river. Vibrations of a gong eternal to the last trumpet, the grapes trodden or the bloody stain. Greatness cleft from legend, greatness itself without tense, like all I ever have. All right, so the second piece is, uh, I have the arrogance to write on uh, mid middle-aged woman's perspective. Um, and not, not so much her perspective, it's kind of my view of a composite of a couple of women that I know. Uh, and it's called So Over That Hill, uh, or A Whistling Woman. After all the sweetness is spooned, husbands raised, children divorced, words trampolined from the belly of the tongue into the blackness of the throat surface now inside, echoing between the cavernous room and a vast wasteland of mattress. You rummage the mirror, pull the skin under your eyes taut with the blame finger, his new bride aging you. The pulleys screech in your chest, each breath inching a flag should have left him dead, should have swept behind the leaving body like your ancestors fencing the tarrying spirit. The front hitched bra swings open like an unused storeroom. 
its flailing plunge like a broken shoot. Plush slippers, a cerulean blue, fading like planned sit-ups and morning walks. You tell your friends you don't miss sex. The TV scrubs the silence off the hallway. Scheduled phone calls, midday soaps, you miss sex. Night drags day into night. You and that dream where you're holding the earth, where you're holding a tree to stop the earth from turning. You're lost at sea and no one can find you because you keep wearing blue. You don't know what it means, but you know never to die in your dreams and in the sweaty aching, in the sweaty waking panic, there is you. Sun to a withering planet that has given unto everything but itself. That these deflated breasts this belly on magazine could never again be held flower by the fickle men who gift image. That these are but shells is more than religion, it is tragedy. If we never walk from them till we are expelled. You will find yourself in the body of your own voice. Desired breath shaping the mouth into a kiss or the gratifying summon of a whistle. Thank you. Oh, Dingo, here you go again. <laughs> you know, we need to stop inviting you places because you're just too much. You're just too much. Husbands raised, very nice. Children divorced, very sad. I kind of look forward to an empty nest, but not really. I don't know. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dingo, as always, for your poetry, for your words, for your perspective on people. This is the power of words. So I think what we can do now is open this up to maybe some introductions, some self-introductions, right? I think we speak well of ourselves. So I will give a bit of an apology. We have Kwame Dawes joining us, but not until 12.30 Jamaica time. Um, you know how it is. We have competing um, events taking place. So he will join us at 12.30. So don't worry, he is coming. But what we have right now and who we have right now are Annie Paul, Diana McCauley, and Luke Naima. So if you could each say perhaps just maybe two to three minutes about yourselves and why you're a part of this experience here today, what it is that you do for writers. All right, so perhaps we can start with, let's see where my finger lands first. It's with you, Annie Paul. <laughs> okay. okay. Hi, uh, greetings from the Caribbean, everyone. We have to remember that there are actually people tuning in from elsewhere. I actually saw a tweet this morning, I was delighted to see it, from the Literature Students Union in, Ken in Nairobi, Kenya, um, to, you know, promoting this, this launch. So um, greetings to everyone out there. It's so good to have you with us as we launch. Uh, well, first of all, let me remind everyone what PRE is. PRE is a digital online open access magazine um, that we started in 2018. Uh, there were four of us initially, and I want to shout out to Charmaine Lovegrove, who was <clears throat> very much, uh, very instrumental in, in the founding of this digital magazine. Um, life has taken her on a different path. She's about, she's, she will be having twins soon, uh, and we want to congratulate her and wish her well. And so we've been going since 2018. Uh, we, we are on our seventh issue now. We come out twice a year, online only. And what I realized um, very soon after founding it, after uh, starting it, was that there were many friends, especially um, people who, have, who are from a previous generation of Caribbean writing and other older friends and so on who don't and are not used to going online and definitely not used to reading online. And so it became obvious that they were not partaking of pre, to put it simply. And I thought this was such a huge pity. So right from the get go, we, we talked about um, bringing out, occasionally bringing out a print edition of selections from the digital issues. And finally, three years later, we are bringing out our first print edition. It's called Bookmarked. And it's, it's a very handsome um, object 
a collector's item. And I want to now shout out to the designers, Cohen Shabaka, that's Nadia Cohen and Sarah Shabaka. They did a magnificent job. Let me just show you some of the, um, it's, it's dedicated by the way, to the past, present and future of Caribbean writing. And, you know, it's beautifully laid out. We've kind of spared no expense with this publication because I believe that production values are very important. And for that, and for the ability to invest in this book, I want to thank the Prince Claus Fund who supported us with one of their next generation grants. And one of the requirements of the next generation grant is that we, uh, it is to support people under the age of 30. So um, in, in choosing and selecting the contributions that, that we published in the print edition, we did focus uh, to as much as we could on, the, on, on publishing the work of the youngest authors who have published in pre. Um, and it, it, is, it, is a, it is a really a, a achievement that all of us are very proud of. And we can't wait to, for people to get their hands on it and to hear what they think of it. And uh, <clears throat> what I want to do now, we, we, um, we're also, by the way, another shout out is due to the Shuttleworth Foundation who gave me a personal grant at the end of 2019, which I allowed me to dedicate more time to pre than I normally would have been able to. Because let me tell you, bringing out a print edition is a huge task. And especially one like this, which is quite complex because we, it's divided according, it is, there, there are these um, sections which correspond to each issue. There are five issues, selections from five issues here. Um, then we asked, I was able to prevail on a, uh, an old friend of mine, Shalini Puri, who is a professor of English literature at the University of Pittsburgh, to write the foreword. And she produced a beautiful foreword, which I think I'm going to read a bit from, so that that will also give you a, a better idea of both Pre, Pre's project, and of Bookmark. The, the first print edition. And by the way, it's not just the print edition. This is also the launch of our uh, print arm, which is called Pre-Ink, okay? All right, so Shalini in her foreword says, describes Pre as a crossroads where Jamaica meets the rest of the Caribbean and strikes up an artistic conversation. She says, this beautifully curated print selection from the first five issues of Pre offers a glimpse of the richness of that conversation. As the title suggests, bookmarked links web page and physical page. By this, I mean several things. In the most obvious sense, the book culls selections from the online magazine, bringing to the bringing to readers who are more at home in the print medium, a different arena of creative writing and giving them a point of entry into Pree's ongoing publication. But I also mean that the artistic experiments like Pree's, but I also mean that artistic experiments like Pree's in the digital medium have the capacity to transform Caribbean literary traditions and print cultures. Pre is artistic breaking news. And bookmarked is a place to linger and return, a moment to savor and celebrate. I'm, I'm going to read a little more. She says in a different part of the foreword, bookmarked is an additional gift to the Caribbean literary scene. It is the inaugural pub publication of a new imprint located in Kingston an imprint by and for Caribbean writers, whatever the locations across whatever literal and metaphorical distances Caribbean writers write, bookmarked brings their writing home. This allows a different and rigorous expo exploration of Caribbean selfhoods that is not framed by talking back, quote unquote, to a metropolitan audience. As the Jamaican Patwa word pre suggests, 
pre is engaged in a more urgent, intimate, and locally grounded placemaking. And I want to stop there for now and um, allow somebody else to, to speak. Thank you so much for that, Annie. And yes, as we continue with this conversation, um, as we continue with this webinar, we'll get back to that idea of being an artistic experiment in the digital medium. And certainly throw that out there as a question to the panelists to think about what are the risks perhaps in taking artistic experiment or making um, experiment of your artistry? Um, is there always a welcome space for that in publications? These are parts of the conversation. So perhaps now I'll move to Luke Naima of Granta Magazine, and you can talk about your expertise and why this fits for you. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Luke. I'm tuning in from uh, London, and where I work at uh, Granta. I'm originally from, from Canada, but I came out here, um, I guess, over a decade ago now. Um, Granta, uh, I've got a copy here, I think. I might just uh, show that off to you guys. Um, here's, uh, here's our latest. It's a uh, uh, print and, and digital publication. We put out about four issues of this magazine a year. Um, Granta started out as, uh, originally it was the Cambridge University Literary Magazine. Uh, when in that incarnation, it published people like E.M. Forster and Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes, these sort of old guard English writers. Then in, um, in the 70s, it was sort of reinvented by a young American uh, student who was there and uh, a, a couple other British editors. They turned it into a magazine dedicated to just the, the latest in literary writing in this sort of paperback form, which, which publishes uh, four times a year. So it's been running in that format since then. Um, I'm currently working as the deputy editor, so working mostly with the print edition of, uh, of each issue. But I also work, uh, I used to work as the online editor. And um, when I first started at Granta, maybe eight years ago, my job was actually to be a reader. So I was the person on the other end of the slush pile which meant you know, my, my job was to read all the unsolicited submissions, both for uh, Granta Books, there's a publishing arm of Granta, and for the magazine. So I, I, I guess that's the sort of initial experience that I'm, I'm sort of bringing to this panel. You know, it's, it's a, a difficult thing making those decisions and, and deciding what things need to be passed on for, for second reads, for um, the things that I, I, I would recommend. So uh, yeah, just looking looking forward to talking to you all on that on that subject. Thank you so much. All right, Diana. Well, hi everyone and welcome. I'm a Jamaican writer and an environmental activist. In fact, um, most of my life I've written in secret, but started on the publication journey in about 28. My first book was published by People Tree Press in 2010. So I am a very proud founder member of PRI as well. I'm part of the group who first started to talk about this amazing product. So I feel very you know, privileged to be here today and happy to be here today. Um, yes, the print edition was a lot of work, Annie, but so was the online edition. So it's, it's really good to see this, this happening. I, I guess my, I don't know if I want to call it expertise, but my experience, is comes from the side of being a writer with a whole lot of rejection under my belt. And I've recently, my, you know, more recently now had this experience of being one of the people who reads the submissions that come to pre and most recently to be a judge for the Commonwealth Writers Prize in 2021. And that's what really got me thinking about rejection, which has been a big part of my sort of writing life. Um, and I write from, from here, I live here. And I think sometimes that has this ex extra dimension of how do you cope with, with you know, the rejection when you're not necessarily physically located in a, in a big literary market. And then sitting on the other side of the desk, when I was the one reading, reading the submissions and making judgments about them, I thought, boy, it would be really interesting to, to have a discussion about this, both just sort of, I guess, lift the veil a little bit about what happens when you send a piece in to, you know, either a prize or to, a, you know, wonderful publication like Granta. 
Um, and also to hear from you know people as to you know the questions they have about rejection and some coping strategies as well. I I don't think ISIS there's a, a writing place where there isn't any, you know. So it's a question of how do you you know perhaps give yourselves the best chance that you have and how do you cope with you know what sometimes can really be a heavy burden. So I'll stop there. My most recent book I am very bad at book promotion, but my most recent book is. That's what it looks like. Thank you so much, Diana. Okay, so since you, I think, brought a nice segue, a natural segue into this conversation, into this webinar, why don't we jump in, right? Um, why don't we think about um, what it is that you're finding, perhaps, and this is to all, um, Annie, Luke, and Diana, what it is that you're finding are the common mistakes maybe the common failings that you see in submissions. Is there a kind of top five list? Um, these issues come up and it's an automatic, it will have to go into a rejection pile. Um, is there a list? Um, you're st starting with me? Sure, yeah. So, so I don't think there's a list. I think the number one reason, the number one lesson I took from being you know, an editor of pre and, and a judge of writing is that individuals bring themselves to a piece of writing. And, you know, my, my colleagues at PRI will know, and, you know, these are people and our editorial panel is much, much wider than who is here today. These are people who are, who are teachers and writers who I, we've all, we all respect greatly their work. And yet, despite that, we disagreed on many pieces. So that was really the first thing that I learned was the person judging a piece of writing brings a lot of themselves. And as a writer, that's something that you, you really have to take on board. It's not, it's not a universal judgment of your work. It is the judgment of one or a few if you, manage, if you make it past a first cut to a panel of your story at a particular point in time. So that's my caveat. I, because of the person who I am, so I'm, this is not true of everyone, I find myself... My, my frame of mind towards a story or a piece of creative work is starts from a step back if the writer has not adhered to the rules of the competition. This is a very simple thing to fix, you know? Um, and so if, if a competition requires a certain font size, if they require certain margins, if they want you to put a word count, if they don't want you to put your name in the submission, these sort of basic things that most most outlets require, please try and fulfill them. Because you want the person reading your work to be in a state of welcoming, of excitement, you know, of, of real happiness to be here, and you don't want to annoy them. And they're human beings who may have other things, you know, bothering them. So, you know, let's keep them out of being annoyed. That's my, so that's my number one. And my number two which probably there'd be a lot of disagreement about, is I have a particular aversion to obscurity that I feel like is being introduced for obscurity's sake. You know, I mean, I love lyrical writing. I love writing that challenges me a little bit, but I don't want to feel you are putting up obstacles in my way for no reason that I can see, you know? So I, I have found sometimes in the work that I've reviewed for Pre, I've wanted to... And, and in fact, the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, I've wanted to speak directly to that writer, which happily pre does allow, but I want to speak directly to that writer and say, you have some jewels here, some gems, but you've kind of tied me up in all this obscurity at the beginning that has made me not want to finish the piece. So I'll stop at two ISIS because that can go on for a long time. Right. No, but that's those great. Are kinda, those are kind of my top two, you know, don't follow the rules and... Don't confuse me unless there's a really good reason for, my, for me to be confused. Okay, so it looks like we might be able to build a, a kind of top six if we each add two. So we've got those two. Luke, I feel like you have something burning. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, no, I, I think Diana makes a really good point about uh, the way in which um, all reading is subjective. And so that's, that's a place you're starting from as a writer. Uh, you have to find your audience. Personally, I think uh, in writing, anything can be interesting, any subject, any uh, scene, however simple, however uh, 
uh, banal. It's just, it's all in the telling. So for me, when I'm reading, I'm always reading for voice. Um, if something, what I want, what I want when I'm reading is, is to, 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 to recognize something of the author and the prose. And, and one thing we get a lot in, in our submissions is, is very polished writing where it almost seems like the authors uh, have taken such great care to sort of perfect each line that they've, they've sort, of, um, sort of almost shut themselves out of the story. And I think, I think sometimes that comes maybe, you know, a piece can be overworked in that sense. Um, I think you, it, it's better, you know, I think as, as, as a reader, as an editor, it's, it's better to stumble on something that's a little bit messy, but but really alive and really honest and, and feels like it's, 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 uh, you know, vibrant and coming from a specific voice, you know, um, we're all specific individuals. Every individual narrative in someone's head is completely unique and you sort of want to let that out in your writing. Um, but then, you know, we're, we're all reading stuff all the time. And, and, and I think there's often a compulsion to try and tone things down, try and shape it towards, you know, something else we've read or, something that's a bit neater. So yeah, my, my re first recommendation or, or the first thing I'm looking for is, is, is uh, yeah, voice and, and uh, don't, don't, um, yeah, don't keep yourself out of your writing. Um, and then after that, I suppose another thing that I, I really love in writing is a very specific detail, character specific detail, a sp place specific detail and and so I think as, as, as authors, you know, you want to spend a lot of time with your characters and, and, and with the places they're in and really try and visualize that and bring that out. So I think just taking the time to, to really deeply envision um, the psychologies of the people you're writing about and um, their surroundings, you know, th those, are, those are two recommendations I'll, I'll add to that. Thank you. Annie, what is it that you, put in the rejection pile automatically? What are the two big no-nos? Oh, Annie, I think you're, I think on, you're mute. on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one of the things I've noticed uh, coming through with some submissions is something that I've been the victim of myself in sending um, articles, you know, which I considered to be completely, you know, they were complete uh, after numerous rounds of editing and so on and rewriting. This is now the final version I've sent it off. And then to my horror, when I look at, for some reason I might happen to open it just to check. And I realized that the track changes um, feature was left on. And so whoever is receiving it, who's usually a high up editor or something is gonna see all these terrible, you know, marks on your on your in your document and you you absolutely want to avoid that and so when i receive something like that i feel justified in putting it to one side and waiting until i have either have time to get back to the contributor and say look you we can't consider this unless you send us a clean version and sometimes you don't have time to do that so it just gets left in the pile so that's a very simple thing that everyone, including myself, need, need to be aware of and double check. And then the other thing that annoys me is, you know, we have very specific instructions about not putting your name anywhere else, like on the other pages and so on. And then people just go ahead and have their names in the footer. So it appears on every single page and uh, makes it a little more work to anonymize the, the piece before sending it out for review. Um, and yeah, so I can't immediately think of anything else. Most pieces get uh, at least a read. You know, we're not like Granta, which gets 10,000 submissions a year. And I would love to hear Luke uh, from Luke how they manage that. You know, what is the system they use to manage that? We don't get anything near as much as that. We might get maybe 60 or 70 submissions for the, for the two issues annually. So um, the scale is completely different, but I'd love to hear from Luke how they manage that. Yeah, um, it, 
it's a challenge. Yeah, we get up to, I think most years, about 10,000 unsolicited submissions. So that's a lot, a lot of reading. Um, and we're, we're a pretty small team. We have um, four, uh, four or five editors uh, reading. So we can't, we just can't get through it all. So what we've done is uh, we've uh, set up a submission system online via a place called Submittable. And that charges a small fee the idea being before we didn't have any fee and we were getting a lot of pieces in that just weren't finished, uh, that you know they didn't read our guidelines. These are the things both you, Annie, and Diana have raised. You know, they're just sending random pieces to us. So partly introducing the fee was to, to force people to think about what they were doing. And it's also a call back to the way that submissions used to be done a small postage fee, you know, the fact that you had to actually put your piece of uh, writing, you had to print it out, put it in a letter, all those little steps actually force you to think about what you're doing. You don't just click and send it to a thousand places. Um, but the other thing that's allowed us to do is to pay a team of readers to help us read through um, the, the submissions. And um, so we have a, a circle of readers that we've put together over the years people who we've worked with, who've uh, come through Granta, either as um, on the editorial team or interning or, or, or people who've been recommended to us. Um, and, and, you know, everyone who joins, we, we have them do a test and, and we're, we're quite thorough of making sure that their sort of reading standards are, are similar to, to ours, our taste is similar. Um, so they'll do a first read and, and they'll recommend pieces. Uh, so if they read 100 pieces, they might put forward one or two to the editorial team to read. So already you see that it's, 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 there's a sort of statistical chance in there of your, of your piece getting uh, picked out. I think great writing always stands out, but um, yeah, it, it, it's hard. It's hard when you're starting out and it's hard when you're trying to break in because, you know, the you have to you have to keep trying and you have to wait until you get that reader who will recognize your writing. So after those are put forward to the editorial team, we read them, we discuss them as we discuss all um, the writing that comes into Granta and we make decisions based on that. Um, at the same time, sort of com competing for our attention is uh, another raft of submissions that come directly into us, uh, the editorial team. That'll come from authors we've worked from before. They'll write us directly. We're always reading uh, publications and reaching out directly to authors, asking them to submit. And um, above all else, we have huge amount of submissions from agents. And agenting, I'm sure, is a subject that'll come up in this forum, in this discussion. It's, um, I think it, agents have become increasingly uh, dominant, I think, especially in the UK and uh, the publishing scene here, I think it's it's because there are so many people submitting, a lot of publishers here now only read uh, submissions from an agent. They, they've closed their open submission systems uh, with the idea being that the agents then do that work. They're the ones who sort of discover that talent. They, and, and all agents do take unsolicited submissions or most, most agents do, I think some, uh, of, of the, the biggest agents uh, personally will have a closed list or will not be looking for more clients, but most are looking and, and there are a lot of great young agents out there who are looking. So that's another thing to think about, another side of that uh, conversation. Um, yeah, because partly a rejection is based on the, the ways in which you're, you're putting your piece forward to be seen. There are lots of different av avenues you can take. Um, Diana, maybe you have some thoughts on that in your journey, sort of bringing your writing out. I think the, the thing that I learned, and I learned it the hard way, is not, not to write to prizes or particular publications, right? To write, mm. and, and it comes back to what you were saying about voice and excitement, to write something that you're excited about and you have this strong wish to put on paper and work on it for, you know, to a degree and then put it down so that you have this stable of pieces that are available. And then when prizes come up, because, you know, if, you have, if you're a writer, you start subscribing to places, you know that when there are competitions, you know that when submissions are open, 
then you go through your stable and try and match what you've written to the particular um, outlet or, or prize. Um, sometimes I sensed in reading the Commonwealth pieces that, and those are also a, a large amount this year, it was 6,400 um, submissions. Some of the pieces I got the feeling that they were written to the prize and the writer had run out of time, you know, so the, it, it hadn't really been, you know, thoroughly edited, properly fleshed out or even thought through. And in some cases, there's, there was almost a feeling that, that, the, that the writer had gotten sick of it and had not really finished it, you know. So I think, and, and you don't really, you often don't have a lot of lead time to you know, open calls or prizes. So I think it's better to keep working on your writing all the time and sort of create this, this bank of stories or nonfiction pieces or poetry that you have. And then when you see opportunities, you then try and match what you have written to them. And that step is important because it's important to know what people publish. Not everybody publishes the same thing. So, you know, it's no sense sending you know, something that's just unsuitable for granted. You're just setting yourself up for those rejections. So, so that's, that's what I have to say about, about the writing process. I think it's, you have to try and it's hard not to, eh? Cause you, 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 you tend to feel, well, I have to get publication. I have to get my work out there. But I think if you center yourself on what is it you want to say and what is it you want to write about, the products that you have are better. And then don't rush, I would say, to you finish something and you're like all excited about it and oh, this is gonna make a huge difference. No, let it sit, let it cook as, as a teacher will tell you for oh, a good while, you know, four weeks, six weeks, which is why it often doesn't work out with a timetable and then go back to it. You will find lots to fix. And then when you're reasonably happy, I totally agree with Luke, don't over edit, don't make your piece flat, you know, so that it's very competent, but that's, that's all, and wait for the right opportunity. And I will say, there is a certain amount of luck involved because the numbers are so, are so high. When you get rejected, the very first thing you're, you do is you send it somewhere else. So just don't bother, sit around like more. I've learned that my morning period over rejection is 24 hours. I allow myself that where I walk around the house, I eat too much, I tell myself I'm a failure, I do all of those things, but I'm only allowed to do that for 24 hours and then I send it out again. Those are my little practical. I think that's, that's good advice, um, good suggestions there from, uh, from both of you. I really appreciate that. And I think that our viewers appreciate it as well. Um, so you started touching on, Diana, you started talking about the fact that writers might not want to write to a specific call or to a specific prize. Um, maybe we can take this opportunity to think about the current situation, right? That we're in this pandemic, we're in COVID, um, and perhaps there are a great number of writers who are writing their COVID stories. Um, should writers avoid trends when thinking about submissions? Should they avoid a, a certain topic that might be um, overly done or overdone by other writers. Can you talk about that? How to how really how to stand out? How to stand out in a in a pile of many many submissions? I, I read a critic and I can't remember who. I've been trying to think who it was so that I could sound more intelligent. But I remember what the person said, and the person wrote that a story has to enfold you at the beginning, pull you in. And you're just right away in this world character set situation set up. And I think that's the thing really that at the beginning of a story makes a difference. I found myself in, in you know, having much more reading than I've ever had to do for, for pre for the Commonwealth writers, becoming a bit over it when I felt like, oh gosh, this is my story on whatever, whether it's a pandemic or climate change or you know, dystopian fiction or speculative fiction. There, there's a bunch of stuff that, you know, you start seeing in, in, a, in if you get a big amount of submissions. So, but I think the most important thing is not to get so hooked up on that as to, as to the enfolding part, you know, the, the, the compelling part, the thing, the voice, the other things that make writing worthwhile. And, 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 but if you do find yourself writing something that 
okay, there are lots of pandemic stories, then I think you should think about where to send those things. So look at what the publication record of that particular place is. If they've already published, you know, lots of pandemic stories, so their last issue had six pandemic stories, and you might consider that perhaps we can anticipate that their next issue is not going to have another six pandemic stories. So I think it's more of a question of matching what you've written to the right place as opposed to functioning as a kind of sensor. Okay, you know, speculative fiction is off the table, you know, dystopian stuff is off the table. Although I have I, I have received rejections from from people from you know a, a publisher specifically saying, you know, we just got too much dystopian fiction right now. This is really nice, but I have too much of it. So that's what you're that's the juggling act, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to, to echo that, I think with the, the pandemic, we here at Granta have a huge amount of, of pandemic diaries, pandemic fiction, pandemic reportage, every every angle of it. And um, at the start, we did publish a lot of that. But uh, I think writing into the news cycle, it's so hard to hit that. Uh, to, to come out with something fast enough that you're actually still fresh by the time someone can get around to publishing it. Um, you know, if you're a super quick writer, and you know, that's very lucky and, you know, why not try for that? But I think for the most part, it's, as Diana says, you, you know, chances are by the time you properly finish a piece, if, if, if you take down as very good advice and, and work slowly on your, on your writing and, and set aside for a while and come back to it. Often, whatever trend you're, you're, you're writing into, if it's a new cycle thing like the, the pandemic, you'll have missed it. Um, that, that said, I, you know, I, I think anything can work when, when it's written well. I mean, although we published, we had an issue um, called Still Lives, which was talking about uh, the beginning of the pandemic, lots of pandemic stories and, and fiction and nonfiction. Um, and we, we sort of said amongst ourselves editorially, all right, we've done this, we're, we're looking for new things, we, we've done that. But um, in the most recent issue we're putting together, someone had submitted a piece of fiction that was set during the pandemic, you know, uh, someone dies of coronavirus, there are masks. Um, but it was so artfully done, uh, it didn't feel like um, just written off the back of this idea, it just felt like that evolved naturally. That was just part of this world this author was responding to. Um, so we, we really enjoyed it and we, we, we've taken it and we're, we're working with it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that comes back to that point of just, um, when you write, I think you should be trying to think about your writing practice almost sealed off from the idea of this prize, this, you know, this trend and just, really work on your writing alone and, and, and let it develop slowly. And the input you should be taking is input from the authors you admire most. I mean, read the authors you love and then imitate them and, and try and deconstruct what they do to make a scene vivid, um, you know, transpose it into the world you're writing. Just, just experiment that way. I think, I think that's much more effective than saying, oh, this is in the news. Maybe if I write a story about it, you know, something will click. I think just take the time to focus on, yeah, the, the nuts and bolts of your own writing and yeah, take it slowly. Thank you. Right. It does seem, of course, that to be a better writer, you have to be a better reader. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess in that regard, do you all recommend that um, writers become more familiar with the interests of those who are judges? with the writing, I'm sorry, the reading interests of those who are editors and publishers, does that make sense for a potential writer? Should they do that? I, I think, uh, just to jump in again, I think, I think the more you read, the better. And, you know, it's good to read outside your comfort zone uh, and to, to try things you you wouldn't normally try. So if, if, if looking at, a, if you look at a journal or, or a judge and, and you see names on, on a list that you don't recognize, I think, uh, why not read? Um, more sort of pragmatically, I think it is important to, if you are submitting somewhere to know enough about the publication to anticipate the sort of things they um, publish. I mean, here, sometimes I will read something that's 
really well written and great, but it's just not for granted. And that may be because it's you know, more journalistic or it's um, you know a, a straight genre, something that we don't necessarily do. So yeah, I think doing a little bit of research there is is useful. Um, but all for reading as, as, a, as, a, as a mode of, of learning and developing your craft. Mm -hmm. Annie, can you jump in a bit um, and talk a bit about the, the pre space, um, what you might recommend for those who are um, poets and writers that are submitting to pre, what direction should, should writers go in in terms of what to read? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this came up already, but one of the things I often wish is that people who submit work to us would read what we've already published to get a better idea of the kinds of material we do, we are interested in. And also of the, le uh, of the kind of quality of writing that we expect. And so I think that has, I have seen an improvement, a better fit over the seven issues. I think people have got that point by themselves. And so we don't get as many random submissions that definitely don't make, you know, even begin to make the cut. We don't, we get much less of those now. But one thing I'm curious about, and, you know, more than make statements, I, I have questions uh, primarily for Luke, um, because one thing we found, if you remember Isis and Diana with Pre, this is the first time we've always had, so far had themed issues. And this issue, forthcoming issue seven, number seven is the first one where we did not uh, theme it deliberately because we were interested in seeing whether we would get more submissions if, it, if there wasn't a theme attached to the issue. And in fact, indeed we did. And so I'm curious about Granta because Granta also uses themes for most of, it, most of its issues. How often do you do unthemed issues and have you seen a similar trend, Luke? Um, yeah, uh, that's a really good point about uh, theming. One thing we, we sort of make a point of not announcing our themes to um, in our channel for uh, submissions, because we almost prefer to have pieces come in unthemed, as you say, because I think people feel a bit freer and then sort of build a theme around that. Um, so we, we, we try to avoid announcing the themes in advance. And um, I, think, I think that comes back to that point about writing towards a specific idea. Sometimes, sometimes that works out, but sometimes that sort of, uh, I think distracts a writer from you know, what they might do otherwise. And often it's better uh, for us to, to, to build around uh, what comes in. And it, you know, if you, our, our latest uh, issue is called I've Been Away for a While, it's sort of riffing on this idea of what's happened with uh, uh, Corona and everything, but it's, it's, it's a pretty loose theme. And within that we can contain a lot, uh, but by the same token, sometimes we do very specifically themed issues. So um, the issue we're going to press with now is, is a list of the best young uh, Spanish language novelists. And, and so that's a you know, very specific thing. We're just looking at um, a specific group of Spanish language writers. So yeah, it varies and you know, that keeps things interesting. Um, but yes, hello, hello Kwame and welcome. Kwame, welcome Kwame. Kwame's joined us. Um, Isis. Yes, I see. Thank you so much for arriving here now. We are looking forward to, to your input. So right now we're thinking about, um, clearly about publications, right? And we're thinking about, well, what is it that we're looking for? What are publishers looking for? Um, what pieces get published and which pieces don't? So you can jump in in any way that you would like to at this time. Mm. Um, I'm, I can catch up, but uh that's that's so broad that i don't know where you were we've been in yeah. many places we've been in many places and, and the difficulty for me is that i i'm where i wear multiple hats as a right. publisher so it's you know whether it's people tree whether it's the african poetry series whether it's the you know prairie schooner which is the journal that i 
I edit, I edit all of these series. And so, so those questions differ for each of right. those, um, right, but, right. but I, I'm, I'm catching in. I'm, I'll, 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 I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in when I think, you know, when you, when you, when you're playing, um, when you when you're playing rope, you kind of have to watch carefully before you jump in. Or as you get tangled <laughs> you know, up. You might hurt yourself. There are no traps here, Kwame. No, 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 no. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> I, I have a, a question here. Um, mm. This is for anyone that wants to answer it, and and it's it might seem obvious that there is a particular kind of answer, but I I guess I'd rather you all speak to why your answer is what it is. <clears throat> and the question is: Should every writer? work with an editor, even a lay editor, before submitting a piece, which is to say, if I have this great story in my head and I'm writing it, should I have at least one person, even if it's my neighbor, should I have at least one person look over that work before submitting it to a journal, to a prize? What, is your, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, for me, the short answer is no. I mean, like that's, that's just, that's just, too much work. Um, but what I would say, though, is um, I think writers have to develop over time the capacity to distance themselves from their own work and become their own sort of editors. And the, otherwise, otherwise it, 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 even when you get an editor to look at your work, you have to make the decision. So I think one of the great lessons that I pay attention to when I'm teaching writers is to think of themselves as their first reader. And, and that means a kind, of, a kind of imaginative separation of self. It's imaginative because of course we are who we are, we are still who we are. But if we, can, if we can imagine ourselves separated from ourselves and then being driven by the things that, uh, that delight us, that move us, that give us uh, a critical sensibility, I think that the great writers have the capacity to, to create that distance and to put it, put in abeyance their empathy, the sort of cold, the sort of necessary empathy for a moment, um, to then to then see see what is happening. And and I think that's what is most important. Having somebody else read your work is helpful, but it depends on who you ask. Like you know, you, there are some people who are not helpful, um, and there's no point to it. And I can't say that as an editor, when work comes to me, I can tell if somebody has had somebody else read it or not. I, I, I can't tell, it's not, it, it's, not, it's not possible. So writers must know themselves. If you're lazy like me and you know that your work is gonna be full of typos and all kinds of things, then yeah, get somebody to read it, uh, to clean that up. Uh, but um, yeah, it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be unfair to ask people to, and, and sometimes unreasonable because all, all writers are different and all writers' experiences are different. So that's, that's, that's what I would say, yeah. Thank you. I've, I've, I've had, I've, I've benefited from first readers. I would not call them editors really because they're not necessarily, you know, I mean, editing is a very detailed and lengthy um, process and, and I would say expert too, you know. But I, I have been helped by people who read my work in, in an early stage. And they are people that I trust um, and that I've developed a relationship with over the years. And I'm willing to hear from them, boy, Diana, this just does not work, you know? So I, I, have, I do have early readers who can <laughs> sometimes tamp down my, you know, over-enthusiasm about a piece. And I've benefited from that. So I will say that. Anyone yeah. else want to jump in? Okay. I, I, I think it can't hurt uh, to have other people read your, your writing. Oh, but you know it can hurt. It, like, it oh, literally can well, hurt. Well, if they're, if they, <laughs> if they, are you if talking they, about? You got to choose, you got to choose carefully there. You got to choose. I mean, I think what you're saying yeah. about being oh, your own best really, editor. it really, really hurt. Like, yeah, yeah no, you got to be I, your own editor. But it, it, yeah, you got to, you got to choose someone sensitive to, to the writer's ego. Someone who's not going to totally shoot you down. But, um. There's definitely like small things, you know, things that make sense in your head that sometimes don't come across on the page. Uh, I think especially for writers starting out, and um, those things can be picked out uh, by by most most kind of careful readers. But yeah, you gotta you gotta be careful who you ask, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, that that depending on who you you pick, it can be useful. And when I I started writing um, 
a column in a Jamaican newspaper called The Herald in the mid 90s. And because I'm technically a foreigner, I'm from India originally, although now I've spent much more time in Jamaica than in India. I've been here for 32 years. But I remember when I first started writing my column, I had the benefit of um, a reader who reviewed everything before I submitted it, particularly to avoid, you know, huge glaring cultural cultural errors, but this person was also an excellent uh, writer, right? And so he was also teaching me how to write better in the process. And for me, that was a very, very important foundational um, exercise. And so I, I totally get you, Kwame, uh, if you have the wrong person read your work, and I know you had a foundational trauma uh, in that regard. <laughs> so, yeah, they put uh, it that way. <laughs> Foundational but, trauma. But, but you can, you could, you could say, Kwame, that that has only spurred you on to greater heights. No, no, I didn't. I that wasn't a, that wasn't an invited commentary. Like no, was, I know I, that was completely. Somebody thought themselves generous enough to help me out, but no. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. so no, the reason I'm being this way about it is that I think all writers are going to have to be different. And um, and I, I do think that at the end of the day, even for all of those of you like like Diana and so on, who say, look, I, get, I have my, my readers and so on and so forth. You do know that something that has developed in you has been developed over time, a greater facility to actually know your, know your shtick know the little things that you normally do wrong and so on and so forth and know how to assess what people what people are telling you and and so on and that i think what i really want to emphasize the the value of of building that critical sense in you that that part of your your role in 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 in, in structuring your approach to to that and i'm not i'm not this look and i work with so many writers and different writers need different things I have writers who want me to fight them. I have writers who want me to just say, you're amazing, and they will work out the rest. And, and that's just human, you know? So, um, but does that help you get the work sort of finally done? Because you see, my problem is um, you get it done however you get it done, but get it done, that's the problem. You get, however you're gonna get it done, get it done, but get it done, you know, so yeah. So I think I think it's I think it's 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 important, but um, it has its value. Okay, yeah. so mainly for typos and clarity, but you know the writer should. Oh, no, no, never said that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, ten more minutes. Never said that. I'm summarizing everyone's words. <laughs> okay, okay. So I have I have a question for everyone here, um, and I see that there is a note here in the chat box. So it's actually kind of working with this and also a general question, um, which is what should, what should a writer do when you get no feedback at all, right? So you make your submission and you just never hear from the, the space ever again. The journal doesn't contact you. You don't know if you've been rejected. You, the assumption is, you know, time has passed so that you've been rejected, but you don't have any indication as to what went wrong. Um, what do you do with that? Move on. Just move. Yeah, I, you know, I, I sort of give myself, I, tr I hope, I try and make sure I have some idea of what the approval or rejection timeframes are. When I started out at first, it was rare that anybody would tell you, oh, our review period is three months or five months or six months. But I, I say it's, it's more common now that you'll see some indication in, when a submission is being our review time is three months or six months, right? And I allow myself one follow-up email. So, and then if that is not answered, I have a, a spreadsheet where I keep track of where I've sent stuff because door brain not so sharp anymore. And I just put in there, you know, no answer. And then I send it somewhere else. You know, I've, I think this is one of the hard things about, about rejection and you rarely, do get something more substantial when you get a rejection. It's often a form letter. I can't tell you how many letters I have gotten which tell me my writing is stunning, it's amazing, it's breathtaking, it's words like that, but not for us, right? So 
it's very rare that someone engages actually with what you've said. And I have had, I've had a couple experiences like that, which were foundational and formative. And one of them, one of them was for the early manuscript of Dogheart, which I sent slush pile agent, big agent, I had very big dreams in the beginning. And they did send back 12 pages of critique, which what oh. was eventually made me revise it and, and it found publication. That's very rare though. So, yeah. you know, I, I, this part of it to me is hard. It is hard, it is difficult. So for me, I've just decided whatever time period they say, I will wait and then I send one follow-up and if I don't hear anything, I move on. That's my strategy. Did I mention the crying part? There's, <laughs> there's some crying in there as well. Of course. Any other thoughts? Well, let me address the people tree thing. You know, I think every, every, all right, let's put it in some sort of a kind of reality. If you're a Caribbean writer and you're writing Caribbean work, there are limited places that you feel, okay, these are go-to places that I can get a fair shake. Um, you can try, you know, other places, but, you know, that do not have a record of publishing uh, Caribbean writers. And if, you're, if your suspicion is that that is going to be a problem, uh, it's not an inaccurate suspicion. It, it, it's, it's just uh, true that publishers have sort of knee jerk reactions and say, this is not in our, this is not for us kind of thing. So, so that, there are limits. And, and therefore, when, when you as a Caribbean writer send to a place like People Tree, which you, who you know publish and so on and so forth, and you don't get an answer, um, I think it can be disconcerting, it can be debilitating, and it can be very, very, you know, very much a problem. I think, though, that in the particular, what was in the chat um, was not speaking about, I think the chat comment was really fair to say, look, if you don't like it, just reject it and let me move on. But don't, don't keep me waiting with nothing, right? Um, and and I suppose I and I think I think that that is that is a fair kind of expectation. So what would happen is because I'm because I publish with People Tree and I work with People Tree, I think I can say that one of the things that might help you to sort of have a perspective on what is going on is that is that um, that's my bad dog um, is that <laughs> is that is that people tree is two people, right? And largely one person who is reading the fiction and making all the decisions on the fiction. People tree receives work from the Caribbean, all over the Caribbean, but increasingly from what we call the black British experience. And then people tree receives work from, from parts of Asia, from the past colonial places like India, Pakistan, and so on and so forth. And there's one person for the fiction um, sometimes two people for fiction. Um, that's P Jeremy Pointing, the editor, and um, Jacob. Uh, Jacob, J J Jacob, who Ross, you know, the, yeah. Jacob Ross, who does fiction with him. And then for poetry, it's myself and Jeremy Pointing. So, so what happens therefore is that you you can be fairly, if you think about it, and you think about the numbers that come in to be reviewed. The delay is is largely driven by just pure person power, just 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 that. Now that's not helpful, and that's no excuse. Because here's the thing: I'm not telling you this as an excuse. I'm telling you this as a perspective. Um, therefore, it does not necessarily translate that that no response means they're not interested in your work, right? It does. It doesn't translate that way. And so, if you if if there was somebody talking, you know, if I was talking to you, I'd say keep keep harassing them, just keep, keep, keep harassing them. If you, you know, if the work is still available, but don't, don't hold it if you can send it elsewhere, but you still keep harassing them. So that's the best I can say to you on, on that front. Um, but, but, you know, I agree with that. I mean, look, you know, um, the, the, the rejection thing is just something that you have to build a system around. I mean, I, I always remember that the year of my book, Midland was published in the state because I was published by People Tree for a few years before that, about four or five books. But I wanted to see if I could get a book published in the US because this is where I live. I sent it to, it was rejected at least 40 times before it won the Hollis Summers Prize, right? Um, and so, so what does that mean? And, you know, but my thing was, 
this is a good book. I know it's a good book, so I'm just going to keep sending it until somebody picks it up. I've met some of the editors who rejected it. And they tell me all the stories about the meetings they had and how, you know, we really blah, 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 blah. That didn't feel that way from where I sat, right? So so I do think that you kind of have to build, I think Diana is right, that you kind of have to build a system that says I'm going to persist and and just keep keep pushing the the thing out. The good news is in the last 20 years, the last you know, I would say the last 10 years with the advent of submittable and so on and so forth, more writers in international spaces are finding greater access into, into, into publishing in the, in the US markets and the UK markets. And I think one of the secrets to that attention would be to, to, to take advantage of access to publishing in journals in those places because of submittable. Because believe it or not, I think editors and agents look at your publication list where your stories have appeared and so on and so forth to feel okay this person has already published in this part of the world they may not say it that way but i think it makes them feel as if somebody already has endorsed them in this space and therefore it's translated into this space so journal publication may seem like nothing you're interested in you just want to publish your novel but it it is a good thing to do to create a track record of that kind of publication because it does make you more interesting um, to agents uh, as many of you know agents here there are some agents who will scour journals and then call the, 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 I get calls as as editor of Prairie Schooner from agents saying you publish so and so do you have the address I'm interested in them um, because I think they, they, I love the story that they sent. So that happens all the time. And um, whether that translates into publication or not, at least it's one way um, to, to, to think about. It. And that's especially for international, uh, international based writers. A lot of Nigerian writers and, and so on and so forth, which we publish a lot in people in Perry Schooner, Prairie Schooner, uh, writers from different parts of Africa and from the Caribbean have appeared in Prairie Schooner, have then had births at at American pop presses, largely because of that appearance. It just sort of makes people feel, okay, they're not, they're, they're, they're not strange people. Yeah, they're not strange. I'm okay. glad that Kwame brought up a- agenting because I was about to do that. Uh, because that example of uh, Lisa who submitted her manuscript to um, People Tree and so on. I mean, ideally she should not have to do that herself. She should be represented by an agent. But one of the problems we in the Caribbean have is that there are no Caribbean agents and it is very difficult to attract the agent, uh, the attention of, of the international agents who can place this work with reputable publishers. So that I don't know with uh, the changing landscape of publishing, whether it still makes sense for people here to try to become agents themselves or just use the existing uh, ones out there. I don't know. What do you think? Listen, you, you know, my view, my view is it, anybody can become an agent. But you need to know the ins and outs of Yeah, but you only know it if you push it. Like, here's an agent that if you're in the Caribbean and you say, I'm a Caribbean agent for Caribbean writers, you've already kind of started to create a market, a corner that it's, 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 it's like publicists. You, you know, people, anybody just get up and say, I'm going to be a publicist, but you do need to know what it's about. But I'm saying that if you are interested in that, first of all, you can start thinking of that as a career approach. By the way, you know, it's a side career for the to start off. But yeah. I think if you think of it in that kind of way, then it's good to start asking because we don't get enough of those questions. We I get people saying, I want to publish a novel, I want to publish my books. I want to, I don't get enough people calling me and say, I want to be an agent. I want to see what I can do. Who can I talk to? Because I guarantee you, if you come to me and say, I want to be an agent and see what I can do there, I can put you on to many agents who will talk to you. Great. Because Expect they, a message no from me. Yeah, there's no. I'll pressure. call you later, Kwame. I'll call you later. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there's no pressure on them because they, yeah. you're not be- begging them to publish a book right. or to sell a right. book for them. Mm-hmm. All you're doing is asking them, "How does thing work? Right? How does this work?" I think, and 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 by that I mean, listen, I'm not saying it's like automatic and it's just straightforward. But if you have the intention, 
th that path can be created and you can become a kind of brokering agent in, in, in the Caribbean. It's possible. Yeah. Now, the question is, will the good novelist, will the, I only choose novelists because nobody is representing poets. Right. Nobody. I ain't bother with it. If you don't have a, <laughs> if you don't, if you don't have a memoir or a novel that you say, well, I'm working on one. No agent is coming to you as a poet. And me a big, big poet, and nobody <laughs> talking to me about none. Right? <laughs> right? No agent right. interested in me because why? Because no money in it. Like I get a one thousand dollar advance on my, and the agent says so only two hundred dollar I get for all the work me do. No, they won't do it. Right. So so and I think it's a stupid attitude because, you know, eventually people like me bring in can bring in money to you. But that's that's another story. I don't want to get distracted by that. But for novelists, they are, the anxiety that an agent, somebody, an aspiring agent will have is to say, will I get a big will I get Diane McCauley to come to me as, as somebody who just starting off? Because Diane McCauley, a big writer, so she's going to need. So you're going to want a big agent who can open doors for her and talk to the big presses and so on. So that would be the anxiety. But I think if you want to start, you can start from the beginning. If you see a good novelist that is coming up, you can start working with them and so on. It don't cost you a tremendous amount because everything is online right now, right? So it doesn't cost you that much. And you might start to see some momentum that takes place around that. I think it's possible, right? But, but like I say, it takes some work and, you know, but nobody comes to me and says, boy, I'm trying to be an agent. What can I do? Mm -hmm. We've seen people who are interested in being publishers and we've, we've have, you know, you know, we've tried to broker and make arrangements with them to work with other publishers abroad and see whether they can model and work together and so on and so forth, because that, that, that's something you can learn as a skill. So there are whole, there's a whole industry that we just don't want to touch, right? Yeah. And it would be like in Jamaica where we don't, it, 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 like in reggae music, it would be like saying, boy, we just want to be a singer, you know, but the person who say, I want to be a producer and an engineer, that is the, and they look at, look at what, what engineering and producing has done to Jamaican reggae music, because those people took that on. Right. I that just want to say, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just want to say that after 10 years, I still don't have an agent. It was easy to find publication yeah. in, in, for books and for articles, as you said, Kwame submit to, you know, places where if, you, if, it, if it's in your bio, you, you're, you get a whole different eye. Yes. Finding an agent has been harder for me than finding, than getting publication. That's why there's a need for Caribbean I, agents. I, I think so. I, I do think, think, I, I think so. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the chat, I said, right. yes. about, about costs. So I yes. do want to. Please. Okay. So I'm just going to frame it for all because it's, I'm not sure everyone can see it. Um, and this kind of pulled together several points that have been made already. I know Luke, you had mentioned submittable earlier and you talked about the history of um, publishing, right? Where, where um, individuals have to put something in a, in a, in an envelope and send it off and there's a cost. And, and part of that helps to make the experience a bit more serious. And perhaps the, the writer will take things more seriously. But the question that's coming to us here is about essentially paywalls. Um, if, if writers are expected to read in the journals that they want to submit to, and of course, as Kwame's pointing out, um, past publications can lead to future publications, right? So if you're required to or expected to be reading these publications, what do you do when you can't afford subscriptions, right? So is it enough to be able to just read the, the free trial versions or the limited access of publications or should writers also have to pay this money? What do you no, suggest? And no. Diana, I think you're ready to go. No, we, <laughs> well, editors, we editors of major publications and, I'll, and I, I, I know Luke <laughs> has a lot to say about this. So I'll just talk quickly and then Luke can join it. We, we like to tell people that if you want to publish with us, you should read our journal and you, know, you should take all the subscriptions because we want subscribers. Like that's, that's the truth. But, but as a writer, look, you can go to pre Perry Schooner online, and in a few minutes, you can get a sense of, without paying anybody any money, get a sense of what we publish because we feature some of the work online. Like it's, it's that that happens. So you, you can get a set, you can go to Granta online and know right away what, what Granta does. So, so, and we don't, we don't, I never look at somebody sending work to me and say, did they, did they read our journal? I never do that. Like, I, I just read the work and I go, eh, no, eh, yeah, no, yo, yeah, I don't, I didn't bother read your bio, right? So, 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 the, so the truth is, 
it's a good practice so that you don't waste time. Right. Like if you do, if you if you're sending work to an experimental poetry journal and you send them a short story, it's possible that they may think, "Wow, that's an innovative approach to the poem." Or most likely, they'll say, "You just don't know who we are." So why yeah. you know right? But but that's that's not. They're not going to sit down and put you on a blacklist now as, "Oh my God, don't ever think about this." They're just going to go no because every journal. What you want is an opportunity to say no. We, I get 3,000 submissions a month, like, like 3,000 submissions of poetry a month. My task, my, my readers and so on, all they're looking for is an opportunity to say no. And saying no is just no. Like, I don't have to think about it. And we say no. It's not a, it's not, it's not a judgment on the person. It's just a moment that is made and so on and so forth. So no, you don't have to read you don't have to subscribe to the journal to know more about the journal and the internet is making that so so much not necessary now look hey if you submit if you if you if you subscribe we love it right we pay attention but i don't think if you i don't think we, we i've never published somebody because they subscribe to our journal now i publish people i'm more sympathetic to people who write reviews for us but that's mm -hmm. another story <laughs> okay but that's a good nugget <laughs> Okay, Diana? I say that there are costs involved. Um, most prizes now are not free. It's, it is the yeah. unusual one that is free. So, and there are, and there, there, are some, there are some places where if you enter, you do have to subscribe to the journal that you're entering for. So there are costs involved. Um, I, I try to think about, so there's the whole creative side of writing, which is the part that most of us want to do but then there's the other part, which is the business section, which certainly I don't want to do. I, let me not speak broadly, but I don't want to do and I, and I dislike. But there is that part that has to be done. So I, I actually have a position that I will spend every dollar of any advance I get on the costs of trying to, you know, to get published, build a readership, whatever. I mean, it includes other things as well, you know, all the book promotion stuff, you need graphics, you need a whole bunch of stuff. I, if anyone is listening to this and, and imagining that they're going to have a writing career that's going to make them rich, I'd like to say that's just highly unlikely, you know, I mean, yes, of course, there are the few people that we all know about, but it's just highly unlikely. So if that's your motivation, it's not going to carry you through week after week. So I actually have a budget that I spent, that I love myself to spend on entering things and yeah. So there are costs involved and it's like any other business. I mean, you wouldn't start to sell, I don't know, soap and imagine that you have to produce the soap, market the soap, package the soap as the soap. And there are costs in being a writer too. Yeah, uh, to, to, I think you guys both make great points and sort of cover this all. I just wanna say, you know, um, you can focus maybe too much on all, you know, being writers and wanting to get published, but we need readers too. I mean, if everyone's just publishing their writing and not subscribing to any magazines, who's going to read? Who's going to read your 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 piece, right? And at the end of the day, it's 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 important to to really take part in that community and to yeah. to read as as much as you you write, and and that'll make you a better writer. Yeah. It'll make you a more informed writer. It'll help you. Uh, yeah, there's a cost, but you don't don't subscribe to everything. Don't don't uh, don't subscribe to every journal that says you know you have to subscribe to to submit. I mean, think carefully, read the free pieces. Think you know is this something I like? Is this something I feel like I'm getting into that's inspiring me? This is giving me some motivation to do my own writing. I think choose the journals carefully, but it, it's important to to keep that industry going. It's it's a funny industry, and we need readers too. Yeah, um, I have I a just. Quick I'll just say quickly, Annie, um, that, you know, recently I had a cry from the heart from a Kingston bookshop there, mm. and, you know, and, and that moved me to reach out to my social media contacts to say, look, guys, if we want bookshops and reading and literature and support for Caribbean writers, we all have to tool down to, to the bookshop and buy a Caribbean title, you know, because yeah. it's struggling, especially in COVID. Mm. So if, if we want this 
to succeed, we have to participate and yeah, we have to buy books and read books and subscribe to journals and, and be part of a, a writing community that does have some costs. I have a question for Luke. Um, you, you, yeah, uh, I know Granta does these foreign editions and earlier you mentioned a Best Young Spanish Writers edition that's gonna be coming out. And I wanted to say, um, isn't it time to do a Best Young Caribbean Writers? I think, that'd be, I think that would be great. Right. Uh, an issue focus on ca yeah. uh, Caribbean writing. I mean, I, I, I think that's a fantastic. I'm, gonna, I'm going to actually suggest that to our editor. Um, great. Hmm. Yeah, they, they, they come up in different country focuses. It's sort of here and there. And um, I think, I think, I think the, the, that is a, it is about time we do, we do a focus on. Well, yeah. if you need any help, Pri is there. Oh, well. <laughs> Look at us making deals all over the <laughs> This is nice. I have um, a couple of questions. Uh, one is coming from the YouTube chat box. And so this question is asking for advice. Um, I guess quick advice because we're already at 120. So we only have 10 minutes left right. of this session. So how can one self-design a curriculum to help build writing. So not just the suggestion of read extensively and it will increase your writing, write daily, it will make your writing better. But is there any other suggestion you can give to a writer poet um, that they can do outside of an MFA program, right? So budget friendly, what other suggestions do you have? I'd say, you know, Google is your friend, right? And, and a lot of great writers, great teachers have their, their syllabus online and a lot of universities will post the syllabus. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not the, the legit way, but you can, you can see what's being taught. It's not the same as going into a classroom and having someone really think about and respond to, you, to your work, but you can get a sense of what's being read and, and at least try and, try and get started on some of that yourself, I suppose. Okay, any other suggestions? Okay, as yes, you can continue to think about that one. I'll pose this other question in the meantime, just because we're being aware of time. So how would you narrow down a short list? What is that process like, right? So you've been able to take your thousand um, submissions, 10,000 submissions, um, you get down to a short list. This is for prizes. What makes a winner a winner? This is for prizes. What is, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Like as a judge? Yes, as a judge for writing prizes. How do you make that that leap from? How does a writer go from the shortlist pile to being the winner in that shortlist? Yeah, of the, of the prize. Yeah, that's that's. Um, it just depends on who the judges are. You know, it's and it can be it can range from political, it can range from history and so on and so forth, or it can it can. I think I th my view is always that once you clear like the long list, everybody can win. Mm -hmm. mm. Like every and it, you know it just and it depends on what the 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 the, the dynamics of that group is. That's why judging is a very funny thing, you know, like. I don't know if you've noticed like here in the States that how many more black poets or poets of color are winning prizes. This, this was not accidental. Right. The judging panels changed. More mm -hmm. people of color became judges. That's what happened with poetry in America. And that's within the last 20 years. Remember, Toni Morrison couldn't win a prize in America, like nothing. Right until black writers came together and put an ad in the New York, in the New York Times and said, what's up with that? This is after Toni Morrison had published several of her great, the novels that are classic novels now. She couldn't win a prize because who was sitting on those panels? Hmm. It's nothing to do with quality. It's just to do with a kind of, a kind of recognition that the, the, broader, the broader your judging base, the more likely that so we can't, it's, you see, quality is a funny thing, you know? And I think sometimes if somebody says, boy, I win the Pulitzer, I'm a great writer. Eh, not necessarily, like it doesn't, because like who remembers who won the Pulitzer in 1986? Who won the Pulitzer in poetry in 86? Like, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. No, you don't remember that because that doesn't, you know what? You, there are many people, look at the Pulitzer list and you'll be like, who is this? Who, who is that? Who is that? Who is that? So that, that's not the test. Because you don't know what happened in that journey. I've sat in panels and I watch people <laughs> operate like, like, like nothing. 
So, so I think it's fair to say that the, the long list tells you it, it's, the first, it's the most sincere way of thinking about quality and so on and so forth. But as you start getting down to the short list and so on and so forth, then other dynamics start to play a, a significant role. Now, people would like to, if you talk, if you talk to the book of people, they will pretend that, oh, it's all quality. But you saw what happened in the last book of prize, why, when they split it between Margaret Atwood and right. Bernadette Ever Everisto. Now, why do you think that happened? You really think that was just a question of people thinking quality? No, that was people saying, look, they're all great. So why are we picking this one instead of that one? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean in this time, in this year hour? What, what does it mean? What are the implications of that? What is your track record as a prize? And who have you left out, right? And who have you not left out? Do you know people go to Ngugi Wathiongo's home every year <laughs> at the time of the Nobel? Reporters sit out. Ngugi tells the story of reporters. His wife has to bring them tea and everything like that and then com commiserate with them so that they don't ball and, and fall out because he never wins. Yeah. And you're going to tell me that Ungugi is not a good writer? No, Ungugi knows better than that. So we know that it's not at that point. So if you if you are a writer and you get on a long list, embrace it. Hmm. Yeah, that's a bit that's a bit I want to support now that I, I have have experience with being a the judge of a prize. Yeah. Is that there's actually much more attention that's given to the compilation of that. Yeah long list to the, to the words and to the actual writing than the process that occurs after that you know and well i haven't participated yet in the in the in the next stages but i can imagine that a very great i've, I've had people though when when i have been on a long list or a short list and not one which is the very majority of my own experience i've had people contact me and say boy it was close you know <laughs> Well, I think I think at that point when you're, you know, if you make it onto the shortlist, there's a lot, a whole heap of other things in play yes. about who actually is the winner. Yes. These are some of the things that as writers, you you kind of have to understand about it so that you don't, take you know, it, take it yes. too much inside and it makes, and it can make you stop writing. It can yeah, be yeah. as that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, there's a lot to, I guess, digest here. Um, is this another question? No, okay, sorry. Um, so it sounds like the, the tides are turning, the tides are shifting with regard to literary spaces, right? The spaces for publishing, the spaces for um, entering prizes and the opportunities are growing, especially for those of us who are in the Caribbean or writing out of the Caribbean. And perhaps as more of us perhaps step into the space of agents, it can bring about even more change. So I guess we'll all be doing the, the work. Is, does anyone have any comments that they want to make, suggestions they want to offer to those who are viewing, questions that weren't covered and we just want to raise those points? I'd just like to say thanks once again to our um, sponsors, the uh, Shuttleworth Foundation and the Prince Klaus Fund, because, you know, without help like that, I mean, one thing about PRE, it is a digital open access platform, and we have to find ways of sustaining it, and we have to find a revenue model. We don't want to necessarily feature ads. We don't want to charge subscribers. We want to keep it open access. So um, that's something that we are thinking about, and that was one of the reasons one of the, the rationales for publishing the book version or, or an edition of selections from the first five issues of Pre was that eventually, I mean, not just the fact that its materiality is so, you know, actually holding a book. I'm sorry, I, I'm so gung ho about digital everything, but nothing can beat the experience of actually holding a real life book. But in addition to that, um, it, it can eventually become a revenue earner, you know, because people will want the book because it does have excellent content. And so these are the ways, I mean, we have a writing studio with the top writers, you know, people like Ingrid Passard, Marlon James, Kai Miller that we've had to postpone 
for the third time now um, because of COVID, but eventually we will get it off the ground and it will be a money earner. So we need to think about ways in which to sustain our writing uh, apart from the traditional ways which are all becoming obsolete. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all to you participants, um, panelists for sharing your words and sharing your time today. Thank you, Diana McCauley. Thank you, Luke Naima. Thank you, Dingo, for your poetry. Thank you, Annie Paul. Thank you, Kwame Dawes, for joining us. Um, I just want to remind everyone that Bookmarked, Pre's first print anthology, will be available for you to have and to hold starting next month. Um, it's at the printers right now, so that is great news. But if you follow us on our social media accounts, which are at prelit mag on Instagram and prelit on Twitter, you'll be able to find out exactly what that date is. And it'll be available through all of the usual avenues so that you can grab your copy in Jamaica, throughout the Caribbean and around the world. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for joining us. And I guess we will bid you adieu. Take care, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Take care.